oh no, I'm leaving the meeting. Good evening, this is Mike Ungerman and I am the Central Florida Computer Society Linux SIG chairman. And this is the meeting of July 14th. And we are going to cover a bunch of things. What you're looking at on your screen right now is the shared screen of the Lenovo computer, which our um, SIG is using to demonstrate the various things we're doing for Linux. And here is the agenda, whoops, wrong computer, <laughs> left hand, right hand. All right, famous last words. There we go. Oh, here we go. Okay, here is the agenda for tonight. So we are literally in the informal discussion. <laughs> when we get done with that, there'll be a short synopsis of what we've done so far over the last two or three meetings. I lose track. And the focus this evening is going to be on installing software specifically for, for Linux uh, Mint Cinnamon on this computer. And we're really not gonna dwell on what this software is going to be used for, whether we'll even keep it on the computer, but rather to look at the methods of installing software, especially when we get into something more complex than just uh, getting it from the uh, software manager. We'll have a little q and I'll review some of the resources screens, and we'll do some recommendations for topics for the upcoming Linux SIG meeting. And let's see if, if I put this into the next one. Yeah, okay, so we'll, we'll leave it on this for a few minutes. <coughs> so to date, okay, we formed the SIG about three months ago, um, purchased a Lenovo, a notebook computer and um, proceeded to download the necessary Linux Mint distro. Uh, we went over the installation on the computer. And uh, in the next SIG meeting, we did the actual uh, setup and configuration. And we reviewed the software that comes with the, uh, with the distro. And we did actually use the software manager and install. Uh, I don't remember which piece of software we installed, but we installed at least one piece of software from the software manager. And I really haven't done anything with that computer other than last night I did run an update. And then just before this meeting uh, recording started, we figured out from the software manager that the next version of Linux uh, uh, 20, 20.2 20 is now available uh, for installation. And I'm not going to take the time during the meeting to do that because it could require a reboot. And I understand it can take seven to 10 minutes to download. Uh, any questions on what we've done up to the present? Okay. One, one oh, go ahead. thing that you could say that you've done is I think that you've helped put the seed somewhere else because since we've been talking about on the workshops, and I think I kind of mentioned that Central Florida had done theirs, at least in my regional reports that I do for my regions, but the cent uh, the Colum uh, well, I have two groups with the same initials. The <laughs> Chicago Computer Society is starting up their first Linux SIG. So, you know, hopefully from our workshops that we've been having, more and more groups will start theirs up. Well, I find the, the that's how I found you. And that's how I really got kind of interested in what I was doing. Um, in my own case, I had a, a Chromebook as my walk around notebook. And I started to get a little more privacy con uh, conscious. And as I was starting to lock things down, I realized that, well, a Chromebook basically is operating in Google's environment. And I'd really like to get out of that environment and have an independent environment and choose what I put on it. And that's how I got into to Linux. 
And um, I did have my own little notebook. We discussed a, a bit of that on Sunday when the Central Florida Computer Society uh, had their main meeting and I presented some information on my current notebook. And uh, that's after watching a couple of your um, APCUG yeah. workshops, I said, all right, you know, let's do that, but let's, let's focus on the average user. I mean, absolutely. You can, you can dig into an operating system like Windows, for example, and like we used to do with MS-DOS back in the day, and you can learn all the command structures and the file structures and the ins and outs and the batch programming and, and so on, but never really focus on what the user got the computer for in the first place unless they're a hobbyist where they really want to do that. So my focus has been, all right, let's be as productive as possible with as minimal a requirement for being a technology expert and then delve into that area if we have to. We'll do a little of that tonight anyway. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. I do thank you for the APCUG series. And well, uh, I'm just and excited that we've got an, another group that I know of that's starting because of, of the workshop series. Yeah. 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 The one other thing is, I you know, that to everybody needs to know is nobody has to update to 20.2. Mm -hmm. 20.0 will be good for five years. And so there's no need that you have to, unless you see that the 20.02 has something that you really want to have, but it may come down later as a little update. But for those people who want stability, this is a long term. So 20.0 that we have will go five years without having to be upgraded at all. It's, um, I guess you can go on to the, on to the Linux Smith site and actually look at what's new in the, in the update. Um, and, and that's always good to do too, just to get an idea of what's there. Uh, unlike Windows, I don't think we really get security changes, do we? In, in these typical updates? Because Windows has a tendency to, to really push all kinds of security updates out. Yeah, you, you get security updates all the time, you know, with, with um, the Linux. Some Linux de uh, de uh, distros will even let you set up and say, don't bother me telling me that there are security updates. Just go ahead and install them because I know I want them. So just do it. And so you never know you're getting security updates because... You've said, don't bother me with it. Okay. That's a good point. Mike, okay. I have a couple yeah. real quick questions. Sure. Number one, is, is Cinnamon Mint Ubuntu part of Debian? I, you know, when I was listening to all the APCUG software, they talked about different packages. And I'm sitting here saying, well, I don't know which one Cinnamon Mint belongs to. I know that's a really, I didn't know. And then the second question <laughs> Good one. has to has to do with the update. Would you then download that ICO and do the etcher to expand it and then do it? Or can you just click on update to 2.20.2? Answer to the second question, yes. <laughs> Answer the first okay. question, I go to John. Yeah. Now that's the whole thing. You know, my one of my big presentations that I do is why are there so many cars? And in our rep presentation, we showed that there were like five main areas of development for Linux. Debian was one, it's the second oldest one. From Debian, Ubuntu said, hey, we can take the recipe for Debian and we can make it do a little bit more. Later on, Mint said, hey, we like what Ubuntu has done, but there are things that we don't like about Ubuntu. So we're going to make a version of Linux based off of Ubuntu, which is based off of Debian, and make it better. And then there are other people who will be taking variations of all those. So basically, we are all part of the Debian family and Thank the you. Debian <laughs> process. Um, and Cinnamon is just one of the desktops that are out there. 
And in terms of Mint, they have chosen to uh, feature three of them, Mint, Mate, which is what I use, and XFCE. But there are about 12 or so different ones that you can have, just like you can have 12 or so different uh, versions of, a, of the Ford cars and stuff like that. Yeah, I didn't know. So when I was listening to all the software packages going out, I don't know which one goes to to let you know to cinnamon mint. So I'll have to look at it again and, and try to pick up which ones there. You, you yeah, you're, you're, you're focusing on Debian. Anything that's Debian okay. or okay. Deb is was it will work with Mint. Thank yep. you. I, sure. That's... Okay. So well, let's talk in in. We're going to talk about um, packages and, and installing and so on. So you'll see the site. If you're looking at your uh, side of your screen with participants, you're about to get the right side with my lit up headphone as I turn to my left and uh, address the, uh, the notebook, which is sitting over here. So um, you, can, you can choose to, to just have a little bit of me in the corner or just minimize the what you see on your screen. So we're, tonight we're going to look at installing first from the software manager. And, and I'm going to add the Chromium web browser to this installation. Then we're going to download a Debian package and that will be Opera, which is another web browser. Then we're going to download an app image and uh, an app image is, is a compressed image with everything needed to run the program. All the files, all the supporting files, everything is there. So you're not installing it in your system, you're just literally running it. And I found an interesting uh, flight simulator. Uh, I think it will run on this notebook, I don't know. I tried it on, on one of the desktops and then on a great big screen, it looked pretty impressive. And then there are programs that even though you can download the package that without going into the terminal and making a lot of, of um, entries to make that package run, if you run an installation script, it'll access what you downloaded and then install it for you. So I had been using uh, a privacy focused web browser. It's based on Mozilla. And it, it's, it's ba it looks like Firefox, but they call it Waterfox. And I've been running that uh, on my uh, Windows computer. And so it took me a long time to search and find out how can I get that installed on Linux? Because you can download it, but it doesn't self-install. So somebody wrote a nice script that made it very easy, knock on wood. And then um, I'm using Proton VPN as my VPN along with my Proton Mail, and they do have a version for Linux. And there are a few terminal commands that they would like you to use to install it. So we'll see how we use those commands to install it. And then finally on the web, I found a Linux software at Monserabay, I guess it is, dot com, uh, software installations. And he, he talks about eight ways, uh, eight, and some, some are from the way we do it, but some are also just literally eight ways of installing software. Now, let's see if I, yeah, okay. So I'm going to minimize this now. Let me go to my desktop. So the first thing is our Chrome web browser. So let's see if I go there, go to my desktop. See, I did it in, um, okay, we're gonna go do that from the software manager. I wish I'd get my glasses. This, by the way, is the new software manager. It installed with the updates this morning. I, I, I didn't really notice that much of a change, but then I really wasn't looking for specific changes. But we'll just search for Chromium. 
A word about Chromium is many of you have used Chrome as your primary browser on your Windows computer. And uh, this kind of goes back to what I wanted to do with my uh, little note, personal notebook is I did want that compatibility, but I wanted, um, I didn't want it to be in the Google environment. So Chromium is actually an open source project and it's available mm -hmm. to be installed on its own. We'll is that, that both in Windows and Linux? Um, to be honest with you, I haven't looked for a version in Windows, but that's that's a okay. good question. I don't know, John, do you know? Yep, it will be in, because that's, that's what Chrome came from. That's what Edge came from. And that's what Brave came from. They all came from Chromium. So can you okay. can you download a version of Chromium for Windows 10? Yep. Okay, good. All right, well, you can see this is a straightforward, all we're gonna do is say it's install and it's gonna install it for us. So it's the easiest way to do it. And probably 90% of the software that you'll use from a productivity standpoint is gonna be available in the software manager. Uh, last month, we also took a look at the Synaptics Package Manager, and it's another software store that's, that's on uh, Linux Mint. So it is installing. Now, maybe here's a good question. While it's installing, John, um, as I was researching today for the Computer Society and myself, different ways of changing where cache files are located, I realized that a lot of the entries that control not only where things are located for a program, but actually control how the program operates in Windows is in the Windows registry. Now, what, what does a package do in Linux I don't think Linux has the registry concept. So how are all Correct. those settings, how are those, those settings stored? Are they just within the, the group of files and, and folders that, they, that it installs itself? It's, it's my understanding that a lot of them, you know, are included in config files that are kind of, you know, out there. And, you know, as, as you were doing all, all of your work, you know, my little, you know, kind of chuckle at the back was, you know, that's a lot of work because Windows takes up so much room. Yeah. With Linux being so small, we've I've never ever worried about moving the cache <laughs> here or there. I move my, my home directory to a separate partition or a separate separate hard drive, but you know, I I never worry about that. You know, I've got you you know the the um, um, swap, you know, if need be. And it's just it's just so small, you know, you, a whole uh, distro installs in, you know, 10 you know, gigs. And so even on 128, and they just don't junk up as much as the other ones do. Okay, so we installed Chromium, but unlike Windows, you say, well, wait a minute, it didn't give me an icon. Where did it go? Well, let's first start and find where, where it put it. I could hunt for Chromium, but nine times out of 10, it's going to be sitting here under internet. And there it is, Chromium web browser. So we know it's installed. So I'm going to right click on it. And you can see that I can add it to the panel. So I'll put it down on the panel. And there, the little icon shows up down. Well, OK. There again is because I've co-hosted the pan. Oh, no, I see it. All right, it's there. The bottom of my screen has got a big rectangle in it, I see. But there, there it is on the panel. All right, again, if I go and want an icon for it, then I right click on it again and I say add to desktop. And there we go. And if then if I want to bring it up here, maybe organize it under internet applications and then I could run it, okay? So we'll go back. And let's see here. Okay, 
there are other web browsers out there, but it's a good example of Opera is, a, is another one. Some of you may have heard of it, some may not. So, the one owned by the Chinese. You know, the first thing I did was say, all right, let's see if it's in the software store. So, I went to the software. Yeah, if I type correctly. And let's see if Opera's here. I know it's not, but let's see if it's here. Nope, no Opera. I'll also check uh, Synaptics and it wasn't there. So now I went into the browser and I said, I did a search and I said, okay, I mean, find, show me the Opera web browser. So here is what it came up with. And if we can, let's see if I can go ahead and minimize this thing down and go to installation, download now. By the way, there was a little penguin associated with it. So their web browser determined that I was accessing their site from uh, a Linux computer. And therefore it said, okay, you must be wanting our package. And there we are. It is a Debian package. Okay. So I can go ahead if I like and directly from the website say open what it's downloading with the package installer. But I like to keep files on my computer in case I have to reinstall. So I'm gonna say save file instead. So I will say, okay. And we'll let it do its thing. It's okay, so I want to go back to my desktop and I want to go home and I want to go to downloads and there we go. So there is what I just downloaded, Opera Stable, the version, and it's got a .deb is the extension. So if I double click on this, the system is going to know or ask me, what do you want to do with this? And it's to install it with a Debian. Oh, I see Stan has joined us. Let me admit him. Let's see if he's in. Okay, thanks for joining us, Stan. Sorry, I didn't see you until just now. So we're about to install a stable version of Opera on our Linux installation, and I'm about to double click on it. It's thinking, here we go. It says, okay, here it is and install package. Hmm. Must to make okay. sure that I really want to do it. Let's see what additional software has to be installed. So it knows that there is a library that it needs and so it's going to get it as a part of the installation. I was going to tell you to pause right there because I wanted her to see that it said Ubuntu. So we're getting a library yeah. from the Ubuntu to be able to use in Mint. Now, what I just did is click on the expansion. Uh, okay, do you want to update together with the rest of the system? Now, that's what I wasn't expecting. Okay, so... I'm hoping this doesn't want to do it with 20.2. Let's see. Well, let's see. What do no, you mean? That's, that, it, there's an update to Opera that yeah. since you're doing an update manager right now, it's going to say, hey, there's an update. Want to add that too? As part of your regular system update. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And... Okay, so now I have to move that so I can see it. Close it. She said close on the bottom right. 
Yeah, I don't. Oh, I see. Close. I was looking for yes. All right. OK, so do you want to do it? It's checked. So I'll say next. OK, and I did open the terminal window as part of this, just so you can see what's going on in the background. We could just sit there and watch it crawl across, but you can see that it's actually doing a series of commands. And let's see, are we done? No, it's still thinking. Yeah, you might point out too that we're using a special program called GDebi to install this. And sometimes on some Linux, they doesn't it doesn't come with it like Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be able to install your own programs and not always be installing the version that Ubuntu wants you to install, if you use the GDebi program, then you can take control of installing it. But that's already a part of. If yeah. you've got any references on that, would you put it in chat? Like or how a link, do you a link spell it? G D E B I G Debbie and <laughs> G Debbie. Okay. Debbie from Debian. Okay. So, oh, it's well, okay. Now it's saying the same version's already installed because I'm back at the install window. This caught me once before when something like this happened. It's just basically they could have said it's finished. But you can also tell it's going to say reinstall package and you don't need to do that. Okay, so I'm going to close this and I'm going to do the same thing again. There's no icon on the desktop, but I'm going to go ahead and I'm pretty sure it'll be an internet and it is. So there's Opera. Right click. I don't, well, I'll add it to the panel. That way I'll have all my browsers on the panel. Okay, so there's the Opera. And then I'll add it to my desktop. Now I know that John likes a nice clean desktop, but being a Windows guy, I have uh, all kinds of things oh. on, on my desktop. So I, I usually put the things I'm gonna reference on the desktop. Okay, and now I have an Opera browser. So I'm, I'm building sort of an internet column here. Okay. Any questions on what we did? Just go to a website, tell them you want to install it for Linux. See if in fact, it's just going to download a, a package that is naturally supported by your version of Linux, which would be a .deb. And in our case, we downloaded it, but you could have just say install. It's kind of like in Windows, when you download uh, an exe file and you get prompted, do you want to install? Do you want to run it or do you want to uh, save it? And I almost always save it first, sometimes even scanning it. Absolutely. Okay, so if back. If something goes wrong and you lose your internet, right? well, then you can't get it again. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at an Apple image program, Flight Gear, Flight Simulator, or not Apple, but App image and you know, I keep doing that. Let's see, I see APPL. Oh, that's Apple. <laughs> no, app image, app image. Okay, so back to the, back to the Firefox and we're done with this guy. So I'm gonna get rid of him. And uh, I, I was looking around for app images and there's actually a library site that's got thousands of app image things on it. So when I found it, I just went ahead and said, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to try this. So all kinds of support. If, if you're a, a, a flight simulator person, uh, all kinds of support on this website, more than you probably want to know. But I will say when I did this for my desktop and said, all right, I want to run it and see what, what it looks like. I got a Cessna sitting on the runway with the brakes locked and the engine off in Iceland, at Keflavik, Iceland, with the volcano smoking in the distance. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, all right, well, I want to fly it, you know? And I said, well, what do I do now? <laughs> and literally, you got to figure out what you have to do. I mean, if you got the manual, you figure it out. But this thing simulates every little detail of the cockpit of a Cessna airplane, right down to turning the keys on, turning the avionics power on, turning the magnetos on, 
uh, setting the throttle settings. And it's, it's quite extensive. It may be too demanding for this notebook. I don't know. But anyway, we're going to try to do this. Okay, so now let's see. I really want to see the down, here we go, download for Linux. And what I wanted to get was the app image. Now, there is apparently some other ways of installing this. Um, a launch pad PPA. Have you, John, do you have uh, information on that? PPA is, is, is personal package. And this is where people have put together something and then you go and get it from them. So you're kind of leaving Ubuntu and going out to get something that somebody else built for you. Okay. Some people don't like that because, no, uh, you know. You could do anything, right? Yeah. Okay. So we are, that's it. There we go. So it is going to download flight gear so-and-so x86, 64, and an app image file. And again, we're going to save the file. I'm used to used to seeing a, an arrow show up here showing the progress of the download. Maybe I'm seeing it here. There you go. Ongoing downloads. There we go. Okay. And Firefox went to a new thing that's a yeah, clock going around. I see that. Yeah, I'm used to the arrow. Okay, so there we have the app image. Now, if I didn't know what to do, I'd say, well, what do I do? Well, all right, let's double click on it and see what it says. Uh huh. App images, no known programs associated, open with dialog to pick a program. Well, now that's interesting because when I did this on my other Linux computer, it offered to open it right away. That's interesting. So it's going to it's going to cause me a problem. Let me see. Hang on. Let me right click on it and see what it says. Okay. Well, now I have to ask for help, John. I'm used to seeing app images literally run by themselves. Do I have to make it? Uh, do I have to uh, say, let's see, if I say make it uh, executable, I think. Let's see, permissions. Uh, read, write. Ah, there we go. Allow executing file as program. I think that's what I had to do. Okay, we will see. Now we'll close it. Now let's see what happens. There we go. That's what I wanted it to do. Okay, so first thing it wants you to do. See how, see how secure Linux is? It yep. wouldn't even let you do something that you've already done. That's true on another computer. Because previously on another computer, I've launched other app image programs. Maybe it kept those settings. I'm not sure. So you've got more to do, all right? You got to get your, your files, plus you need to put this in a folder that has those files at the same place. And I don't particularly want to go to the downloads folder every single time that I would do this. And I also would like an archive of the, uh, the files, which I need to download. So let's... Let's download the archive of the, of the data files that go with Flight Simulator. And it should go out to the, to the website and get them. Let's see what it, where it goes and what it does. Being a little slow tonight. I've clicked, so it's the last time I did this, it actually went to, let's see if it, if it, if it went here to get it. No, it, 
yeah, because it, it actually went back to this and got, got those. So let me minimize that. Should still be trying to do it. Let's let Dick Vogel in. Welcome, Dick. We're in the process of installing a flight simulator on our Lenovo computer. There we go. Let's try again. If this doesn't work, I'll show you what I did do. Let's see if it's going to See if we've got the resources for files. On my other computer, it went and gave me the files. Release 20.3, scenery. Download, 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 downloads. Well, I guess it's under the, under release, I think. Let's see. Gear. Here we go. So this is where it took me. When I clicked on get the data files, it opened up Firefox for me. And then it took me to this page. So I've just manually browsed there. So this is what it wants me to download. Now notice that, that this has an extension of TXZ. So this is basically a compressed tar, which is, a, is an archive package format. So I'm going to click on this. Don't click. Don't click. Oh, I was going to say download, but all right. Yeah. I was it, just going to say that that I wanted people to see or you oh. wanted people to see that there was an exe file. Ah. And new people need to know that exe files will not run in Linux. That's True. Oh. another reason for security. Uh -huh. So even though it showed like 4,000 people all got that one, that's the one that everybody gets. If a Linux person tries to get that one, it isn't going to work. Yep. Okay, so I'm not going to open it in the archive manager. I'm going to save it in my downloads folder. Now, this one could take a bit. So let's see how quickly. I do have a reasonably fast system. And let's watch the little display. Like the, the one that Huey has? No, not like <laughs> Huey. I've got an 800 two. down and 800 up. I've got about 180 to 200 down. Let's see how fast this is doing here. Okay, it's um, about 2.5 megabytes per second, but it's moving along. It's okay. not you, Mike. It's not you, Mike. It's uh, it's SourceForge. They're 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 always slow. Yeah, and and there's you know you can have the fastest internet in the world, but you've still got to go through the infrastructure to get what you want, and that's got to go through the infrastructure to get back to you. So um, going up to a gigabit for me anyway in our house. Oh, Lord, I, I can't think of how many devices I've got, Internet of Things devices. I would just say off the top of my head, 18 to 20 devices connected to the Internet at any given mm. time. And, and that's all taking up bandwidth, too. So um, let's see, 11 minutes, huh? All right, well, while it's doing that, let's go to what I was going to show you as to what I want to do with this package in order to make it work. So let's go back to the desktop. Let's go back to downloads. Okay. So here is our in here, and this is what's coming down. It's just not complete yet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this. And now I'm going to go home. And actually, I'm going to go to file system. 
Yeah, I'm going to go to file system. There's my apps. And I thought I had a, an apps folder. Make a liar out of me on this computer. Okay, so since I don't seem to have it, I'm going to check one more time. Go up and just hit home, not file system. I'm used to seeing APPS in here and I don't see it. So I'll just make one. So you should, depending on how much you're, you've used your distribution and if you've installed other things, you should have, I did have on my other Linux computers, an apps folder. So now I'm going to do that. And now I'm going to create a new folder and call it Flight Simulator. Go into that folder and paste in here. <clears throat> now, once that's in place, I can, again, I can put this on my menu and I can also put a desktop icon for it. So um, when I get the data, I'm going to put the data archive here. I'm going to un zip it is the way I would call it. It's a, it's a tar zip archive and it will create its own data folder and it'll be in the same folder that the flight gear needs in order to run. So I'm just gonna leave, well, let's see, I need to go back anyway to downloads. So we'll go back to downloads and it's still doing its thing and it's still doing that. Okay. So let's, while it's all doing that, <clears throat> okay, next on the agenda is the one that caused me the greatest pain, and that is trying to install something that doesn't even pretend to tell you how to do, install it. In fact, if you go to the website for Waterfox, there's nothing that tells you how to install it. It just says, here's an archive that you can download. So let's, let's do that while we're waiting for the rest of us to do its stuff. Back to Firefox. And so if you search on Waterfox, it's at waterfox.net. Talks about the features, no telemetry, limited data collection, stable API, flexibility. It's basically using all the Mozilla add-ons. And if I click on download, it, again, it knows I'm in Linux. And again, we've got an archive that has been tarred and it's got a slightly different compression utility. Uh, it's a BZIP type archive. And interestingly enough, it's only 72.1 megabytes. So while, while my data is downloading and is about halfway, we'll just time share and tell it to go ahead and save that. And then we will check the progress. Well, it does not look like it's timeshare. Well, yeah, I can see that. Okay, we are moving along. We're in the kilobytes. Yeah. And I know it's not going to be 15 minutes. Part of this minutes. is Zoom, too, that's slowing things down. Yeah, Zoom's taking up a lot of the bandwidth, too. And not only is it taking up bandwidth on this computer, but it's taking up bandwidth on the main computer that I'm connected to you with. And as I look over at my modem, the transmission light is just blinking like crazy. <laughs> Interestingly enough, it hasn't affected my audio, at least I don't think so, nor my video. The 
video is a little bit sometimes delayed from is it a little delayed click. well let me see if i can stop the video on my main okay um, you'll see huey there because i'm using the club's account which is in huey's name now your video is fine what i meant was that uh we get a delay when you click on something Ah. it's a little bit delayed before we see the next thing okay but by me cutting the video at my end i'm lessening the video i'm lessening the bandwidth and i'm not using any video at all on the notebook i'm just sharing the screen and let me look and see what it's doing here it is moving along Can't be 41 minutes for that. So it's waiting for the first one to finish, which is getting priority, saying it's got seven minutes. Waterfox as a browser, as I said, is based on uh, the Mozilla project, just like Chrome is and Edge is based on the Chromium project. And Firefox used to be uh, open source um and and independent software just as open office was and then firefox was purchased and um it's i guess it's still considered the mozilla group but it has got commercial overtones and the people maintaining firefox have decided that they're going to go into the moderation mode and they're going to start tracking uh, data and posts, and uh, perhaps even censoring things that, that the browser is used for. And um, as John has mentioned, when things like that start to happen, you get what's called a fork, where the people who want things to remain open source say, no, I don't want that. Um, we'll, just, we'll just maintain the code and do it in parallel with the uh, with the project itself, any changes that come out to the Mozilla project are incorporated, but it's it's not going to be a 100% clone of, of Firefox. And um, there are have been some incompatibilities I've noticed in a number of sites that if I log in using Waterfox, um, my uh, Chase credit card sites, one of them, it says we don't recognize this browser please update your browser and try again or choose another browser so there there are some in, incompatibilities that are traded off for privacy and security in some cases okay flight gear tells me about two minutes left so we're getting closer Do you pay for um, the Proton browser? Proton, um, well, Proton Mail is the foundation product. It's, it's an email system. It's free in a basic form, which if I remember correctly, it's like um, 150 messages a day. So I go- Everybody, everybody can find out all about that in two weeks. Right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so uh, yeah. I, I went ahead and bought a, a premium account. So yes, and as I recall, it's a little over five dollars a month for the for the uh, next stage up, and it pretty well gives you uh, unlimited sent and, and received, and it gives you um, five gigabytes. Is it John of storage? Something, Something like, like that. that. Yeah, John's going to do a. Uh, a uh, APCUG workshop this month on on Proton Mail. So you may want to register for that. But anyway, but her, they her question her is question the VPN. Was about a brow was about a oh, browser. Browser, go ahead. Yeah, and there's no browser with Proton. Right. But it, but it does have a VPN, and VPN works the same way as it has a basic free account, which has limited servers around the world. And then if you wish to pay for it, again, right around five or six dollars a month, um, it, it has a premium service 
and you get uh, hundreds and hundreds of servers all over the world that you can use, including in the United States. And then if you want super security, they then route it through either um, Switzerland, Sweden, or Iceland, and then to your, your uh, server of choice in the United States. It slows things down, but if you have the need for ultra security and what you're using the internet for, uh, and it, it doesn't slow me down that much, probably about uh, 40, 40 megabits a second up and or down rather and about eight to 10 up. So for doing email and, and uh, file transfers to private file transfers, things like that, it works pretty good. And then if you're a gamer as I am, then you can uh, choose one of the server that's available uh, that's a higher speed. But if you decide you're going to get a combined package, uh, you can get both the premium uh, Proton Mail and the uh, pro version of the VPN. And as I remember correctly, it's like about seven something a month for the two together. And I chose to do that. Okay, we've slowed down again. Telling me a minute and something for the database and an hour for the for the water fox, but that water fox is going to speed up as soon as flight gear finishes. So it should, if it doesn't, <laughs> shame on me. Actually, I can go to uh, my other computer and with a uh, flash drive and just get it and copy it if I need to. But uh, let's see what's happening here. 35 seconds left. We'll see if when it finishes the, the data, the other one speeds back up again. Well, we said it was going to be in real time, folks. <laughs> so we're in, we're in real time. These time, these time bars, you'd think with all the, the intelligence and AI of computer code and what gets put into these systems that they can give you a better and more accurate uh, indication of time left on certain tasks. The watched clock. <laughs> Ah, open file. Okay, so that's telling me that's ready. And let's see if the other one starts speeding up. Yeah, there we go. Much, much better. Okay, so both of them should be sitting in our download folder here in just a second. I'll go, I'll go ahead and go to the download folder and uh, okay, so our data. That's still doing its thing. Where did you go there? Flight gear, data. Okay, so here's the data that we want. Okay, I'm gonna leave it in the download folder. I'm gonna copy it. And then I'm going to go home, apps, flight simulator, and then I'm going to paste. So now what we have is a compressed image. So now we want to uncompress it so that the program knows what to do with it. Once I've uncompressed it, I can actually delete this data package both from here and from the downloads. But it, you know, we have to un undo it. So I will, I'll right click on it and say, it should have, no, I would, oh, here we go. I'm just gonna say extract here. You notice we do a lot of waiting with computers. Please wait. Yeah. While you're waiting, I thought Opera was owned by the Chinese and it wasn't real safe to use. Um, it's, I think it's, it's, I think it's Russian, if I remember correctly. At the time, I didn't know that. And it was back 
when um, we were using a Kronos true image, which is managed by the Russians, and uh, also Kaspersky antivirus, which is managed by the Russians. And of course, of course they all say, uh, oh, no, no, there's, there's no influence at all of the Russians on what we do. So I don't use Opera that much anymore. The only reason I, I did this was to show what you would do uh, if, if in fact you had a package that you wanted to install. The actual creator of Opera gave it up because he was just too tired and it was a lot of work to maintain and everything. So he turned it over to the development team. And then a few years later, he wasn't happy with the direction they were going. So he got his old recipe out and he said, I'm going to make it like it's supposed to be. And that's where Vivaldi comes from. Uh -huh. So if you want to do a better one, then Vivaldi would be better than using Opera, just like LibreOffice, better than OpenOffice. Yeah. Spell the L, <laughs> spell that one. B A uh, B B A L B A V. Okay. It's, it's the Opera. That's, that's yeah. where the joke comes through that Vivaldi is a, Operatic poser, B A V A L D I. It's a real good browser. That would be my probably my second cho choice. And what's your first choice? Right now, I'm doing Firefox and Brave. And I'm using Brave much more also. Brave, Brave is a is, is a, a Chromium based browser, but it's got a lot of security features. I think I said they could send me their ads and apparently there's no way to get rid of that. It was a big mistake. So I haven't used it since. Uh, in their setup area, there's a whole list all of they'll do, Yeah, I know. And all they'll let you do is take the icon for their ads off the page. It doesn't eliminate it. You can't delete it. Well, uninstall so, it, uninstall it and reinstall it. Well, and use a different email address. <laughs> that's the problem. Yeah. Different email address. <clears throat> well, there's there are a number of um, services out there that will give you a temporary email address. I think there's one called 10 minute email and, and temporary email, things like that, where the address lasts for 10 minutes. So you, you sign up, you get it. It's got some weird uh, prefix and, you know, uh, a dot com or something on the, on the other end. And, and, and you could actually go to that address and receive email if you wished, but it's just there so that you can put that into a form that says, we need your email address to let you download this product or something along those lines. Okay, so now we got the data. I don't need, there's the data, okay, flight gear data. I do not need this archive anymore. So I'm going to delete it and free up space. And when I'm done, I may actually go delete it from the downloads folder. Now, this should in fact recognize this data and start the program. Let's find out, double click. Okay, so I still have to say, Tell me where, browse to download, copy your files on your computer. Yeah. Okay, I still have to tell it where it is. It knows I'm here because that's where I started the program. There's the data file. I'm gonna say choose it. I did. <laughs> Let's see if it's doing it. It's probably, hopefully it's recognizing it. The small print says that there's a new version. <laughs> You've got 2023.2 and there's 2023.9. Please update or try another look. This chosen file contains files for version with this flight gear. Please update or try another location. Okay. Well, I'm out of, for time purposes and the fact that we've gone through the process. This shows you essentially how you would install a program from a website that wants you to create an app image uh, file. 
And in fact, uh, Waterfox does have an app image file too, which it took me a long time to find, but I, I didn't want to run it from that archive. I wanted to actually install it. So I'm not going to update at this point. I could update and, and get the updated data. And as I recall, looking back on the website, there was a, a download of the, of the updated files. So that's that process anyway, it's here. Maybe next month I'll just show, demonstrate it if, if I get it up and running. Okay, so we have done flight gear and now we have downloaded WaterFox. So let's see what we have with WaterFox again in the downloads folder. I'm going to have to go back to it. Okay. Okay. So now we have the same thing. We have a water fox um, archive and I'm going to keep that archive and I'm going to move it into a folder under apps, just like I did with the app image. So I'm going to copy it. I'm going to go back to home, apps, new folder, Waterfox. and paste it. Now, I honestly don't recall whether the script that I have works with, um, with Waterfox as an archive or I have to unarchive it first and get a file folder. But we'll go back to downloads and I'm pretty sure that I put that. Yes, here is the install Waterfox script. So I'm going to copy that one into the same folder. So did you write the script yourself? No, it took me hours of searching the internet to find it. I had sent um, all kinds of requests to uh, the support people who didn't really answer me. They acknowledged that I had asked a question, but they didn't answer my question. And I said, come on, guys, I've got Linux Mint. How hard can it be to install? You know, and they say, oh, we give you everything you need. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, okay, I also put it in the wrong place. Let's just move it in there. Okay, so here's the script. Now, to see what a script looks like, I can open it up with a text editor. And... This is for the techies. If, if anybody's ever done batch programming under MS-DOS or Windows, uh, C language programming, so on and so forth. So, I mean, this is what all these commands could be entered if you knew what you were doing at the terminal prompt. But this guy figured out, okay, if I do all these things, I can install everything you need it to do. So let's see if, in fact, this script is going to run. I think I just have to, let's see if I have to make it executable, if I can just double check, click on it. No, it just opened it. All right, so I have to actually make it executable, I believe. Let's see here, properties and permissions, allow executing as a program. Yes, I want to run. Now, I don't remember if I said run in terminal or I just said run. So I'm going to start by saying run, but I think I have to run in terminal in order to answer the questions it's going to ask me. But I'm going to go ahead and say run. And I was right. Okay, so let's do it again. Run in terminal. Okay, which package are you interested in? So it wants to know I want one. 
Hmm. What do you want to do with it? I want to install it. See, now it's going through the script. Because I put that folder in the same location as the program itself, it now knows where to look for all the data. Another uh, feature of um, Waterfox is it will use both the Mozilla uh, store for Firefox uh, add-ons and the Chrome store for Chrome add-ons. Okay. Yes. Uh, do you wish to add a desktop shortcut? Okay, this one I found out. It's better for me to put the desktop shortcut than to let the script put the desktop shortcut because when the script put it on the desktop, it keeps asking me every time, this is not executable, do you want to execute it? So I'm going to say no in this case. That's based on previous experience. Uh, do you wish to remove the app image package? No. And it says it's installed. Okay, how do we know it's installed? Let's go down once again to internet. There's Waterfox, put it on my panel. There's um, panel. It's that guy again. Let's go back again. And put it on the desktop. Okay, back to... Okay, Proton VPN. So. so to download Proton VPN, you want to go ahead and set up an account. Um, you would go to uh, the address that's on your screen, protonvpn.com, and you would create a free account. And they'll ask you for an email address, whatever you're using for your email. You don't have to have Proton uh, mail, but you might as well try it out if you wish and just send it there and set up the account so that you have a login and a password so that when you do install it, you're ready to go. So let's just, this basically tells you how to install it. And it says, let's install our Debian package. Okay. Now this is one step further than it used to be. So they now do have a package. So let's just go ahead and download it. There's G Debbie, John. How about mm. that? Okay. And that was very quick. All right, let's see. Double click the package to install the repo using your default package manager. Okay. So we will go. Proton VPN stable release, double click. I may not have to use the terminal at all, in which case I lied. Okay, install package. Yeah, I remember going through a whole bunch of steps, which is what I really wanted to do. In the past, I actually had to go ahead and uh, do all the steps that this just did. I had to do it at the terminal by copying what they told me to do. So I, apparently I don't need to do that anymore. But anyway, it's here, it's installed. Let's go back, okay. Okay, so now they're saying you want to update the package lists. 
Okay, so we'll do that at the terminal. Oops, fingers, sorry. And let's see what else did they say. Um, now it's interesting, the package updated. So open enter, yeah, we did that. Install the Linux app. Well, we just did, I think. Let's take a quick look and see. Ah, that's why. Okay. We installed it on the computer, but we didn't integrate it with the menu system and a bunch of other things that by doing the install through the terminal, it'll do. Just double check that it's not here overall. No, Proton. Oh, it is. Well, okay. That's there as a package, but it's not there yet installed. So they do want me to do this. Now, again, and because of my fumble fingers, I'm just going to copy this. Go back to the terminal. And I'm going to paste it in. So I got my command in there. Enter. Yeah, it's doing a bunch of this stuff. Plus, it's going to download some additional information. So this is a good demonstration because <clears throat> a number of programs and packages are going to do an awful lot more than, than their complete package is providing. And the, so in order to get it fully integrated with your system, they want you to, to go ahead and, um, and run a series of terminal commands. And as long as they give you those terminal commands on their web page, you can just copy and paste them in without really knowing what you're doing. And in many cases, I don't know what I'm doing. So let's see if it was, I guess it says it's all installed, it can be run. So let's see now if we see it there. So let's look under internet and there it is. Proton VPN, there it is, okay. Again, I'm gonna add it to the panel. And I'm going to add it to the desktop. Give me the desktop. Thank you. Okay, there's Proton VPN. I'll go ahead and put it in my internet chain. And now, if I wish, I can start it up. Uh, because I'm in the middle of the conference and I'm not sure what that's going to do to my connection and the rest of it, I'll, I'll at least start it, but I'm not going to log in and do everything else that's necessary to set it up. Yeah, that's what they want you to do. So they want you to log in. I did set up an account. I did set up a password. You'll log in and then it'll have you connect. And perhaps in a future uh, session, if you guys are interested in and VPNs, we'll, we'll take a look at some of them and we'll go through the procedures and do all of that. So it's, let's see now if I can quit this. Uh, I don't see an X up there to quit it. Do you have That's, it on your toolbar? Yeah, let's see, I could just go on toolbar and, and close it. Correct. Close, yep. Because there is no X on that. Yeah, you have to keep you have to keep it running to keep it. Using. Well, you you know, being a Windows guy, I'm always looking that for that. Okay, so let's see if we are if our link is good. So eight complete ways to install Linux software and apps on Linux Mint. We did some of them. There are indeed other ways to do it. There are actual zip files, even though we did 
download packages, which I call zip, but there's actually dot zip files out there where they would want you to download, unpack it, right click on it, extract here, and then and then and then run it or we'll do whatever's necessary. We did in fact get some tar G uh, type compressed <sighs> files. Okay, and we downloaded them, we unpacked the archive, and then we went in and, and installed it. In fact, that's what we did with, with uh, no, Proton VPN wasn't, uh, it was a deb package, but, and they're telling you how to do that. And then, um, let's see, completely install condition. Yeah, we did have a, a TAR BZ, if I remember correctly. That was that was uh, associated with the flight simulator, and we did not do a, a, an install package from it. Now, this makes me wonder if we could have forced Waterfox to make an install program if the necessary information was in those archives. That if we could have actually opened up that Waterfox folder and then do a make pseudo make install. I'm not sure. I've never never done it. Not that familiar with it. We did do install a Debian file and we did do a script install. We did not do a, a, a bin file install. And again, maybe in Waterfox, I remember seeing a bin um, program in there. There was a waterfox.bin in that folder. And perhaps if I had opened it up in the terminal and given the command change modification, ch mod, and allow an execution mod, remember you saw a little a box that said make ex executable? That's the same kind of thing, make it executable, and then the file name. So maybe that would have done it. Something the bin be file is, is, the, is to Linux what the exe file is to Windows. Good. Well, maybe that's why the Waterfox people said, hey, it's obvious. All the information's there. Just run it. Sure. Okay. <laughs> so maybe if I go in there and say chmod plus x waterfox.bin, the thing will run. Who knows? We'll see. And I wouldn't have needed all those script. We'll see. Uh, I have not done uh, a jar file. I've not come across it, but there's pretty much doing the same kind of thing. It runs under Java and they're telling you to, to make it executable and to run it. And there's the easiest way. So we come full circle. 90% of what you see out there will most likely be in the software manager and in the software store. And if not, it may be one of the ways that we saw tonight for doing this. Okay. Most of what we did was wait, but some good information, I hope, for you. And I will take questions on what we did. Yeah, I'd like to just make a point to, especially to Donna and any newbie, you don't have to do this. <laughs> you know, you don't have to do it. The, the, the software store makes it so easy, running a deb file so easy. I myself, I don't do app images or the other names that, you know, Ubuntu has their own <coughs> snap pack and somebody else has a different one. You know, I don't do. And once in a great while, I'll do the, the longer one. If I find a program that I really have to have, then I'll go through and do the copy paste, copy paste and through the terminal and get it running. But I don't even do all of that. And I've been using Linux for a, quite a long time. Uh, so don't worry, you don't have to do it. You can, in fact, you know, we tell Linux people, you don't ever have to use the terminal. You know, it's terminal is great yeah. once you learn how to use it, but you don't have to use it. That's what scares people off. Well, okay. in, in Microsoft Windows, you don't have to use the command prompt. But there are some things that you do want to use the command prompt for. And it's the same thing. We'll, we'll take a look at some command prompt things. We have as we've been going. 
Um, but they'll be in conjunction with a reason for doing it. A good example is, is maintaining packages. Um, one of the sessions I'd like to do in the future, and that's on a, on a next slide, is look at maintaining your computer. What's out there for Linux that's like C cleaner for Windows? And some, some cases they're terminal commands, in other cases there's programs to do it. Um, I had installed a number of packages on the first computer that I, I put Linux on, and I didn't have the slightest idea, how do I get them off? You know, how do I uninstall it? So there's you know, things that, that you might want to do in the terminal, but, but maybe you can right click on it and say, in, uninstall if they if they gave you all the information necessary um might as well just go to that whoops why did you go away something happened let's minimize this it's not what i wanted you to do okay still going up here yeah, things like uninstalling software, cleaning up your computer, drive maintenance, stuff like this. Much of it can be done from the GUI menu, but you may want to know a few key uh, commands uh, from the terminal to do stuff like that. Okay. Um, what else can I say? Most of what we did tonight was because I looked for things to install that weren't in the software manager. And then I had to figure out how do I install them? <laughs> many, of the, many of the questions were answered as John has a very good, um, I think it was number four in the series of the workshops. No, number five in the series of workshops that talks about the software stores. And that's, that's a, an excellent, uh, video to watch. Uh, I've asked for the supporting uh, materials if I can get it from Judy and to share with this this SIG. But if you go through and watch uh, number five Wednesday workshop Linux workshop number five, you'll see what John's talking about by going to the software stores and uh, and getting the software if it's not available immediately from the software manager when you go look for something. And again, ninety percent it's. You know, if, if you're using your computer for mail and browsing in a browser and maybe put a VPN on it, maybe if you want it, and, and that's basically it, um, you don't really need to add a lot of stuff that isn't already included with the distribution, especially something as comprehensive as uh, Mint is. Um, got a, some people consider it a lot of bloat. But, but it's got a lot, of, a lot of good stuff on it. All right. So I also know, oops, on go, the APUG uh, workshops yep. that uh, were done, there was a, a follow-up of PDFs and uh, the chat. But if we weren't there in attendance, we can't get that. But maybe someone has a copy they can say this is from lesson two and three, four, five, because I know they always send a PDF and then the chat, which answers more questions. I have asked for number four and number five. Um, and, and what I've been doing, I, I, I know I'm gaming the system, John, <laughs> but what I've been doing is if I can't attend the workshop because of, because of conflicts, I can always put Zoom on my phone, which I have, and take five minutes and log into the workshop, say, hello, Judy, I'm here. Unfortunately, I can't stay, but please keep me on the list for the supporting materials and the link. And she does, she's very good about doing that. Yeah, you're, so. you're special because we, <laughs> if, if you came in for five minutes, we wouldn't give it to you. Ooh. Wow. Nasty okay. guy. <laughs> oh, hey, uh, I know. follow up for those people who I know. attend. I know. Not just, Jump but in it's and jump but out. it's good information for computer user group members. Well, so. but she also knows that you're you're trying to build up a Linux group. Yeah, so. I appreciate that. I do appreciate it. Okay, so the upcoming Linux workshop 
Number 10 is the 20th. If you have not registered, there's the registration link on, on here. And I will, right after this meeting is over, I will send this um, impress presentation to everybody. Um, now, I'm assuming everybody's got um, uh, LibreOffice and Impress. So maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll export this as a PDF and then I'll send the PDF out to everybody. And that way you'll, you'll have all these links and, and stuff. Um, so is Impress part of Mint? Impress? Imp it's part of, of uh, LibreOffice. Oh, it's like, okay. it's like PowerPoint is part of, of um, oh, Microsoft okay. Office. Okay. But it's, it makes more sense actually to go ahead and, and uh, just put it out in PDF. And that way you can just open it up and- Yeah, much easier. <laughs> okay. And the, and the links are active in, in the PDFs. Oh, wonderful. Okay. <laughs> hey, Mike. Yes, go ahead. I have a question. Um, in Linux Mint, how do you, in the GUI, how do you jump to a, to a specific file path in the OS? I say I want to get into a certain folder that isn't necessarily uh, immediately viewable on my sidebar or something like that. Is there a, is there a shortcut for that? Okay, let me go over here. See if I'm still sharing my screen. I am. My desktop. Okay, so all of the folders of your account are under your home, okay? Your, your documents, your downloads, your music, your pictures, public templates and videos. Now mm -hmm. today I created an apps folder to contain the packages that I downloaded, but all the software that's here is not here. It's part of the file system, okay? So when you go to the file system, um, bin pretty much contains most of the code, does it not, John? Those are the executable files yeah. for. Yeah, it, I mean, it's, let me see if I can just get a list of these. You know, here's all the, I mean, these are all the, the, the binary. So I just got it as a list. Yeah, so it's I? not just the programs you run, yeah. it's all the stuff. That's like going into uh, the C drive and going into uh, Windows 32. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So Don't Sean, what were, what were you what were you looking doing. to find? Like like for example, um, LibreOffice is a part of the Linux Mint distribution, but I don't have a LibreOffice folder. I can just launch it. So if you wanted to say, if I wanted to go in and see all the stuff that's associated with LibreOffice. I want to, in the, in the GUI, I want to know what a command is to be able to type in the path to get to wherever I want to go. It could be LibreOffice, it could be what, whatever, bin, sbin. How do I jump to that without, is there a command that, that I can type that'll bring up a window where I can just type the path in, hit enter, and it takes me there? Yeah, that's going through the terminal. Okay, so terminal is the only way to do that? Yeah, that's the only place to type. Okay. Now you can you can in in the uh, file manager you can turn you know open it up and add you know the full path. Um, but if you're, you know, it depends on what you're trying to get to. Uh, the people who you know get used to using the terminal, you can do switching to files real fast if you know the if you know the path. So if I'm in the terminal and my goal is to be in the GUI, and I get to the path in the terminal that I want to open in the GUI, is there a command to run that that will then hand it over to the GUI and open up that? Okay, what do you what do you mean by the GUI? Well, we're looking at the GUI and Mike's right. Screen. You're looking at the desktop and all the that's the graphical, graphical user interface. Right. Right? So yeah. you're in it already. Right. Right. So I want to go to a, a folder that isn't necessary that I want to I want to jump to a nested folder. I know what the path is. Uh, say I'm in terminal and I type in the path and I get to I CD and I get to that folder. And then I want to open that up in uh, 
in the GUI. How do I? Oh, you, you would. You should be able to. Uh, is there a it's command? A lot easier. Well, I don't know. I think it'd be a lot easier just to go into the file system and go into it if you know the path that you're going to. Like, if I want to go to the the root, am I looking at the root? No, I'm looking at home no. now, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, that's the root. No, no I'm, I'm I'm at home. So suppose I want to go to the root level in this screen right up here. If or well, it does say root. All right, I'm at the root. It's showing me I'm at the root. Right. Right here. So I'm looking at the root. So um, let's see what I might want to. Does this scroll up and down? Yeah, it scrolls up and down. So um, you'd probably want to go most of the places you go to would be the user. And then there's all of the things that users use, like the bin, you know, the files in there, or you know, your games. I guess I'm not quite sure what you're, what, where you, what you're going after to then open up back in the GUI. Well, I'd like to get to a path in the GUI without having to do a bunch of clicking. So if, I, if there's a command that, I, like on a Macintosh, I can type command. I forget what the command. I can I can hit a key sequence and it'll bring up a window that I can simply type forward slash, uh, you know, and then the path to where I want to go. As soon as that path is filled out, I can press return and it'll bring me to the window in the GUI. All right. So I just I just typed flat slash, and then uh, if you know that let's if you knew it was in bin. So how did you get to that? How did you get to that window? I clicked the search right here. Okay. Right there. And when I do that, it gives me two. It says it gives me two things. It says search for files and search content. Okay. I don't think we can search content from the file manager. I think we can only search for names of files and folders. So the search manager, is this a this is another application? This is, this the, is file the file manager. manager. Yeah, the file manager. Let me see what else I can besides folders. Is that like, is that like Windows Explorer? Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so I'm in that. So I'm I'm in a, I've got a window open. Yeah. And if I click on Oh, I'm not sorry. sure why mine looks different than yours, but when I click on the search, it gives me two search bars, search for files and search for content. Okay. I'm... But if I type in forward slash uh, SBIN and then slash, it's actually looking for a file name. It's not actually giving me the path. That's all right. I'll figure it out. Okay. There, there should be a way to do that. Well, see, with the, you know, with the terminal, when you do it that way, you can be able to type the path and you can use the, the tab key to auto fill, which makes it faster if you, you know, because you know the path you're going to. And then when you get to the particular file, you hit enter and then it should run it, whatever format it is. You can yeah, do that like there. you want to do a, a file that you've got. So there's a command on the Mac and in, in Unix, there's a command called open. And I would just type if I get to the path and I type open and hit a space and put press period and enter that will give me that will open in the GUI that particular folder or directory. So oh, that, that's what I was, that, that, back it up back up in the in the file file uh, explorer. It opens it up in the file explorer, right? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll tell you that that it'll it be work. there because. You know, Linux is based off of Unix, which is Mac. So Linux or Linux and 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 Macs are cousins. So yeah, if, if you just, you know, there are four. You know, you can run a program. Uh, you know, if 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 uh, uh, Mike just types Firefox right here and hits enter, it'll start Firefox. In the in the terminal. Yeah. All right. So even though I'm not, well, I'm at the root at the moment, but let No, you're in here home now. Oh yeah, just. But there, there are cases when I'm in the, I'm working around in the terminal 
and I want that particular path to be opened in uh, in the win in the graphical user interface. And there should be a way to just type a command and have it transfer the transfer that over to the G the GUI, and I can and then manipulate from there. But um, I'll, I'll I'll figure it out. I'll do some yeah. research. Maybe I'll post that in the. Uh, in the group. I would I would have to say it can do if you can do it in a Mac you can do it in Linux. Mm -hmm. This is the commands are different. I was wondering if anybody here knew that command. Uh, you got to be a person who's really spends time in the terminal. Gotcha. I'm, I'm still you know becoming. I do a lot of stuff in terminal, but I'm not a master of the terminal. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. That's what that what that's what Orr's doing in the the uh, Wednesday workshops for the Linux. He's teaching a lot of the. You know, is there anybody in um, in the in this group or the other group that uh, uses one password on uh, Linux Mint? I use LastPass, but not one pass. Bitwarden. Open okay. source. Oh, I see where it is. Okay. I've got two of these for some reason it's doing both. That's what I wanted. Okay. Uh, next on my list is um, when I first started looking at Linux this year, really, right after the first of the year, the first place I went to was YouTube. And anything you can think of even sean what you're just asking for you might find a video on on how to access how to search for um files and or contents um either from the terminal or from the gui and just see if there's somebody has done it uh plus tutorials um there's tutorials on especially on linux mint there's tutorials on linux mint there's multi-part tutorials. There's tutorials on individual subjects, such as uh, using the terminal. Uh, there's tutorials on what, what we've been doing, getting started. Um, it's, not a, it's not a new topic, and there's been authors out there putting things on YouTube for years and years. So hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of topics on Linux. If you've got the time, uh, you can find it. John gave me um, two links today in an email, which I've put on here. The first is three flavors of Linux Mint a review. So that's the three desktops. And then uh, more oriented toward people that are thinking of upgrading their computers to Windows 11 and reasons for not upgrading to Windows and going to Linux instead. Especially if you've got an older computer and it's iffy as to whether the computer is going to support Windows 11. And then I've gotten a lot of tips. I used to get tips from Facebook. Well, I've left Facebook, okay? It's over and done with. It's part of my life that I'm not going back to. So I joined MeWe, which essentially is a clone of Facebook. It's got timelines, it's got groups, it's got chats, it's got pictures, it's got just about everything you can think of. And it, sure enough, it's got a Linux group, at least the Linux group that I'm in at the moment is just, just, it's called Linux 3. So apparently there's been two before it. Um, it's an open group. They may maintain a little bit of control to keep you know, the trolls out of it in that you have to actually post a post for the first time and the moderators have to see the post. And once you've posted it, then they'll accept you into the group and now you're free to comment or post as you like. And there's been some good, some good tips in there um, and you can do searches of the data that's already been posted going back years. So I would recommend to you that if, if you're getting tired of uh, Facebook and you want a safer location, safer in my opinion, uh, give MeWe a try uh, and uh, check out the Linux group if you'd like to. And finally, I know that you're all here because I sent a link out to tonight's meeting in the Linux at Google groups, but it's a two-way street. So John has already given me those two 
links above, even though I emailed them directly to me, uh, you're all welcome to send an email to exactly that address, cfcs underscore linux dash sig at googlegroups.com. We'll all see it. You can ask a question or you can give a recommendation. So um, if you also have a resource that you'd like to share with everyone, I would ask you to, to post your recommendations there as well. Comments at all from, from any of other places that you've gone uh, looking for tips and tricks in Linux? Okay. I just, I just did a Google search and the command is xdg open and then the path that you want to open it's a, that's a terminal command okay. xdg open and it's a standard command in linux mint and you can do xdg um space question mark and get the complete list of options as well i knew you'd find it i knew it would do it there's several xdg commands there's not one that's just XDG. Okay. So it's XDG well, you, you open? XDG dash open. Oh, dash open. Okay. Well, you, you were doing it to do the man page. You know, to find out all the commands. If you go in the terminal and, and, and do a search for, you know, man that, it should give you all the Well, it would be man space XDG xdg dash open okay right and there's a man for that good you have to think about it when you go to the windows command line um there's no real help for what you're about to type other than uh searching online for command help to get get information as to what the various commands are Right. It's nice that it's built into the most terminals anyway. And XDG dash open will actually, you can also open web pages that way if you wanted to. Okay. Uh, future meetings. So, as I said earlier, um, it took me a while to figure out how to uninstall software. So, um, I figured, okay, this this probably would be a good follow on to installing software. So I'm going to leave the software that I installed in, and then I'm going to see if we can uninstall it next time, quote unquote, easily. I did notice when we ran the script for Waterfox that one of the first questions it asks is, do you want to install or uninstall? So apparently it's a good script. The author of that script figured out somebody might want to uninstall as well. So we'll take a look at how we uninstall software. And then, as I said, uh, cleaning up our computers. Uh, what's the equivalent of CCleaner? I'll give you a hint. Uh, it was mentioned in relationship to a leading figure in the 2016 election and how her data was made to go away. <laughs> it's you know, and they said it costs a lot of money and it's free. It's free. That's right. Yeah, it's it's free. available. And I just, yeah. you know, I did a search. I found it. I said, this can't be the same software. It is. Yeah. It is. Which one? It's well, Bleach, Sean, Bleach Bit. John Hannity, oh, yeah, spent, yeah. John yeah. Hannity spent hours saying how expensive it was. Yeah. Well, the consultant who did it. Sure, they for, charge for for the person charged. Yeah, but, but that actually is quite interesting, and it's we you know open it up and we'll go through some of the options. It's it's quite impressive some of the things that you got. It can you got to know it's free or it wouldn't be on my free software. <laughs> um, CFS saw that. Even though there are SSDs in in all the computers that I'm working with here. Um, drive maintenance and defragging and things like that and changing partition sizes and so on could easily be a topic. And then today, those of you who are also subscribing to the CFCS TechSig group, uh, I spent a good portion of the day because I had this prepared tonight, prepared the day before, 
trying to figure out how to relocate the browser cache and free up, it turned out to be about 400 megabytes, uh, free up the space that that cache occupies on the main hard drive. And, and I did find that, and it is a Windows uh, utility that somebody really smart put together because there were all kinds of suggestions online how to do it. And so I will try to research, but I'm wondering maybe just off the top of my head, is there a simple way under Linux to relocate your browser cache in Firefox, relocate your browser cache in Brave, relocate your browser cache in Opera because we just installed Opera and Waterfox, all these things. Where is that actually specified if it's a user adjustable uh, variable or, or a file, INI file or something like that? Or would I actually have to disassemble the code or get the source code and go in and see what it's doing? Because there's no registry. So I, that's something I've tried to research, but if you've got an idea. Um, I'm, I'm thinking that it's, it's in your home folder or your personal folder. And so if you have your home separate from your operating system, if your operating system partition stays very small and you've got a big partition for your home. And so it might not be necessary. Well, I do know when I researched it for um for my new computer i was or no my big desktop computer i put let's see is there a tmp here let's see yes okay here you go tmp so here is a temporary folder and i'm just wondering if any of this is uh as min updates mozilla that's could be could be some of these folders so right away i'm thinking to myself okay if i'm setting up a computer from scratch and manually doing the setup i've got the ability to specify any of these key files as being its own partition i did do that on my desktop on one of my desktops so I'm thinking if I specify that I want to mount a TMP folder as a separate partition uh, on, on the outer space of the remaining space on my computer, it might be the same as just saying if, if that's where the browser cache goes and that's where all the temporary files go, maybe that's where I, what I want to do. Not sure. And what, what would that do for you? Well, I, I don't have the other computer available to plug in at the moment, but I'm looking at about 60 gigabytes of free space after Windows is installed on a 128 gigabyte drive. So that's the space that I'll install Linux Mac Cinnamon. Now, do I want to mix everything in to that one big 60 gigabyte space or do i want to uh put my home on a separate partition do i want to put my var on a separate partition uh do i want to put my bin on a separate partition um not, not too many we're going to talk about that in two weeks but you okay know, I, I don't know putting it on separate partitions that doesn't really save you you know, space, it's still the 60 gigs, you're just chopping it up in the smaller right. spots. That's true. But then um, if I go to back things up, for instance, I, I don't think I would back up, dot, you know, TMP if, if I split that off. There's no reason to back TMP up because it'll just create it again if you start over again yeah. with your drive. But in your backup programs, you can just, you know, go down and pick which folders you want to back up and which ones you don't. Yeah. Or if I do an image backup of everything, um, just choose not to make an image of that partition. So I'll have to, I'll have to think about it, but anyway, that was, that was a suggested yeah. subject of getting into, into that type of thing. 
Um, I don't know why I have a separate instance of this. Let me see. Oh, because th that's that's your impress and not the yeah. presentation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so that's basically maintaining our our installation. You know, some things that we can talk about. Okay, virtual computers. Um, I still have an interest in in looking at running a virtual machine in Linux and installing Windows on it, and I do have the necessary um, registration code. Although lately, you can install Windows 10 and not put that code in until after it's installed, and they want you to verify it by going online. And you can get away with not doing that for a while. So my thought was, OK, I've got several different versions of Windows 10, including Home and uh, Pro. And uh, I also have Windows 7. And I've got Ultra and uh, Home. And so I thought, well, if, if I need to, I could probably put that into an image, bring it up when I want to try something in Windows, and then close it again and not ever save anything. So that would be one, one way of trying things out in Windows inside a Linux uh, computer. That's a thought anyway. Um, and then the other way around is running window programs on our Linux. Uh, it was mentioned in our first session when we were talking about doing an installation. Why are you going to all the trouble of doing an installation of Linux <clears throat> when you could just do it in a virtual machine in Windows and play with it all you want. So I really wanted to have it installed on a computer, several computers, but it's a good idea. You know, why not just go ahead and do that? So anyway, that's those are subjects maybe we might, might like to talk about. Then the subject of file sharing. Um, this latest version of Linux uh, 20 has an application called uh, Webinator, I think, isn't it? I think that's what it's called, Webinator, something like that. Reminded me of Turbinator. And uh, here, I think I have it on my other computer and it's giving me an error message. Let me just see. No, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, Warpinator, that's it, Warpinator. And Warpinator is a uh, send and receive files across a local area network easily quote unquote. Mm. So the idea is if you mm. have several uh, computers all mm. on the same Wi-Fi network at home and they're all running Linux mm. and it's the latest version, you open up Warpinator and uh, allow it to send and receive and you're supposed to be able to transfer files between them. So we'll take a look at that plus just the normal uh, setting up a shared network uh, under Linux, which I haven't investigated in a while. Yeah, I'm in kind of watching a conference here. Uh, are you coming down for dinner? Yeah, I'll be down in two minutes. You're almost over. <laughs> yeah, we're just about done. <laughs> okay, and more on using the terminal sparingly, but even more so, you know, send me your recommendations to the group if you like, things you want to focus on and, and we'll do it. Because we've kind of reached the point where this particular Lenovo is set up and ready to be a productive machine. So it's, it's kind of the stuff that's surrounding that, the things that you as a user would want to be able to do. I notice I don't have backup on here. We've talked about backup, but I haven't actually done one. And uh, that probably would be under the maintaining or the drive, not even drive maintenance, it's data maintenance. And again, APCUG Linux workshops have excellent discussions of the backup methods and so on, which I really don't want to duplicate, but at least I can do some live backup runs and take questions on, on doing that. Comments? It all sounds good to me. Where are you, Donna, on, on 
But why don't you tell everybody what you have done so far on your computer? Very little. <laughs> we had a freezer. <laughs> no, seriously. Very, very little. Um, we had a freezer malfunction. And in the interim, we went and got a, a new freezer. We had to move everything. And then the garage had to be all rearranged because we have old refrigerators that hold wine. So <laughs> it's been, we've been working full time in that garage pretty much. Uh, but I'm, I'm really interested in, the, in that networking that you mentioned, uh, how to network between us all with the same Wi-Fi connection. And I'd also like when you do your, you, you mentioned something, but you didn't say partition. I'd like to see G parted uh, a demonstration of that. So those are things that you, Donna, I think everything Donna, you make, mentioned. Make sure, make sure you register for the uh, next week's workshop. Yeah, I am. I'm registered. Then you're going to. I see guarantee it. I'm registered. Anyway, you see it. You get to see it. Okay. All right, I'll, then I'll see it then. But I'm interested in the network part too. That just sounds exactly what we want to do. And we don't know how to do it. We have this SanDisk eight terabit thing that we could plug into the router, <laughs> but we don't know how to set up a network to even use that. So <laughs> there's a lot of things where we have, <laughs> we just don't know well, how to use yet. If you but have- learning. If you have network attached storage and you plug it into your router, Windows should see it as a drive and Linux should see it as a drive without you having to do anything. In Linux, it should show up under file system and um, or under computer. And uh, in Windows, um, once you turn it on and the file manager open it up and under network, it should it should show up. And both, you know, it should show up automatically. And about the only maintenance that you do with that, I know under Windows, it's going to install the next drive letter. So if you got F or G or H or something like that open, then you may want to go into the uh, drive management under computer management and actually give it a drive letter. Typically what I do is set it far down in the drive letters like X, for example. And then I do the same thing in Linux and, and make sure that, that it's, uh, you know, it's, I know what drive it is. I don't know, I haven't, you don't work with drive letters in Linux. So it's, it'll be a dev something, right? SBA, SBD, At, SBD, SBC. yeah. And can you manually change that if you wish? Or is it something Linux automatically assigns? Can you, could you make it SB, uh, SBX, for example, manually with a terminal command? I think what it is is that you do it with, with your um, config, uh, your uh, FSTAB file, and you mount it so that it mounts somewhere all the time. Oh. Okay. So that probably would be the only configuration. If you wanted it to have a unique configuration identifier, in both Linux and in Windows. And you wouldn't need Warpinator or anything else. I mean, everything's there on that network attack storage. The one thing that you need to watch, and I ran into trouble a few years ago, is that at that time, Linux on the network couldn't access and read a three terabyte. And the size of it, yeah. You'd have to go in and partition it into three one terabytes and then it would work but i couldn't get in to do that because it wouldn't recognize it so <laughs> when she okay. said about eight i'm going ooh. but then again too you you've got file sharing easy enough with uh cloud that uh is, is very simple uh using something like uh, p cloud you just put the folder in that you go to the other computer there it is but no, how much? But you're paying for that P cloud for a certain amount of storage, right? Uh, Donna, you haven't known, figured out who I am yet. Free John, I have a <laughs> okay. free, you have free, free, uh, free amount, and that's okay. enough for me. So and, P cloud is free. Does it work in Windows as well? Oh yeah, it's cloud. So it's it's cloud, 
And, and what you do is, you know, I, I have a P cloud oh. and I have another one. And so you just use a number of them for storage at the free level. You know, you can do the same thing with your, you know, Google Drive or OneDrive, but I like the P Cloud, and of course, Proton is going to have one. That yeah, Proton to... has a drive as well. You get it, but again, if that's it for now, anyway, <coughs> it's with the Pro account. Yeah, but yeah, go check out P Cloud. I use it all the I time. Will. I will. Perfect. Thank you. And, I and the reason I like it is too. because it has the client for Linux too. So it, it installs it and then I can just drag and drop files in. So that's what I do. I, 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 on my big machine, I put, I create my presentations, put it in P cloud, then I can open them up in my laptop. Wonderful. Does it also do Apple? I would think so. I can't guarantee because oh, I'm not an Apple person. That would be fantastic. <laughs> That would solve one of my problems. We share, I have a, a one password manager that I use that's encrypted. And to get it to all the computers, if we, Dropbox only lets me put it on three items. Right. Unless I want to pay them. And that's really all I keep in Dropbox because that's critical, those passwords. But if pCloud would do that and we could pick it up on Windows and Linux and Apple, we'd be in heaven. Give it a try. I will. Thank you. Yeah. Thank I you only keep tip. Dropbox to keep my Joplin, uh, which is like the Evernote, because uh, that's where it automatically goes to to be able to do share. So I have a Dropbox just for that. Well, Dropbox tried to take over uh, backing up everything on my computer. I, I had a nightmare trying to stop that. <laughs> so I, I'm not happy about that at all. And then I'll get a, a message coming up. Dropbox wants, wants to copy your desktop or something. I don't want any of that going there. So <laughs> that's why I'm not so happy with Dropbox. <laughs> and I, <clears throat> I learned, I guess, the hard way that Dropbox shadow copies the files that you, that you load to Dropbox. So if you say, well, I'm going to offload my computer with physical files and upload them to Dropbox, there's a shadow copy on your computer of what's on Dropbox that it, it keeps synchronized. So you may not see it. And if you've actually installed the Dropbox app on your desktop of your Windows computer, when you double click on it, what you're actually looking at is the shadow copy that's on your computer. And if you add something or delete something, it then synchronizes and changes it so it's online and um, it didn't free up space when I tried to do that. So I just said, no, I'm, yeah. I'm not gonna I don't, use I don't like anymore. it, I don't like what it's doing. So I have the same thing, I don't like what it's doing at all. So good, P Cloud, okay. Yeah, we'll we will find it. <laughs> I will check into it too, thanks for the tip. Yeah, wonderful. Final comments well, before, okay. Final comments before we leave. Anyone? Okay, well, thank you for coming. I hope it was productive. There was a lot of dead space in there, but I think all of us, including me, learned a few things because I didn't find exactly what I expected to find based on prior experience of using some of these techniques, but we worked around them and they're all recorded. I will, I will uh, when I stop the recording, um, I will, process it and put it up on the CFCS videos website and I will share that link. And I will also include a copy of the, uh, of the uh, exported or the PDF version of the uh, impress presentation. All right, and, thank and you. We'll, we'll see you um, next Wednesday, John. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. You'll see us too. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll be over on in uh, PC Bug tomorrow night, so whatever location that is over on the west coast of Florida, Sarasota, I guess, right? Yeah, doing a little uh -huh. presentation of the free software oh, for that. Good. Okay, guys. Good. Thank, Thank you. you all. Okay, good night. All good right. Night. Bye bye. Bye.